January 27th. Yeah. Special yeah. study meeting of the Troy Planning yeah. Commission. Yep. Yeah. Copies of the, of the agenda <coughs> for tonight's meeting are available at the entrance to the room. Additionally, the agendas and minutes of prior meetings are available on the city's website. The meeting will be conducted in accordance with the agenda as presented or amended by the Planning Commission. The roles and responsibilities of the Planning Commission are outlined on the reverse side of tonight's agenda. State law establishes planning commissions. The commission is comprised of nine members, all who whom have volunteered to serve. Members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by city council. The other individuals seated at the table this evening are representatives of the city's planning department, the city's attorney's office, and that's it. Uh, if you wish to address the planning commission, please come forward and recognize when recognized and provide your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Please begin your remarks by stating your name for the benefit of the commissioners. All remarks are to be addressed to the Planning Commission, not to anyone else in the room. At this time, I ask that all cell phones, Blackberries, PDAs, or any other devices that might disrupt this meeting please be either placed in silent mode or turned off. Mr. Savadon, the roll, please. Mr. Edmonds. Here. Mr. Hudson. Here. Mr. Kempen. Here. Mr. Krent. Here. Mr. Sanzika. Here. Mr. Sheppey. Here. Mr. Schultz. Here. Mr. Strad. Mr. Tegel. Here. Thank you. All right. You had a chance to review our agenda tonight. Can I get a motion for approval? Move to approve. Second. Did you get that? I did. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Kempen. Yes. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Shepke. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mr. Tegel. Yes. Mr. Evans. Yes. All right. Item number three. Any discussion on the minutes of November 13th, regular meeting, or should we have a motion? So moved. Mr. Sanzika. Second by. Second. By Mr. Shepke. Mr. Kempen. Yes. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Sanzika. Yes. Mr. Shepke? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Tegel? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. All right, item four, public comment for items not on the agenda. And since we don't have any public to comment, we'll move on to item five, Zoning Board of Appeal report. Mr. Uh, Strad is absent. However, I covered the meeting for Mr. Evans. There was only one uh, item of note. They discussed, uh, you will we'll recall, Beachview Estates. The, uh, the applicant int intends to develop a cluster uh, development there. They need a 50% open space. He's only able to provide 41. The ZBA postponed the item. They wanted some more information. They weren't, they weren't provided with a, uh, a parallel plan or a tree preservation plan in their packet. And they wanted, uh, there was some discussion. They wanted the, the applicant to look at the potential for eliminating the the property that he was going to acquire to provide more land and, and eliminate a parcel and go down to nine. Still cluster, but have, have fewer units. And uh, there was some additional discussion, but it was postponed. So they'll, they'll reconsider it in December. Sounds like a discussion we had. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it was, a, it was a relatively long discussion. Uh, did they apply for a, a abatement, for a sidewalk abatement along Beach Road? Not yet, but they, they intend to. <coughs> because that could even be added into the area to keep it natural. If they put a sidewalk in there, it, it would ruin uh, the look of the, the whole subdivision from yeah, that, within and without. Right. That item it wasn't, is, was not in, within their purview to, well, they could talk about it, but it really they weren't okay. acting on it. That's, that's more of a, of a site design <coughs> issue. That's it. Thank you. Item number six, DDA. There was no Sorry. meeting last month. All right. So that's a short report. And number seven, would you like to take care of the planning? Yes. And report? Yes. Uh, last night, last night at City Council, you may remember the Sears Holding Technical Center, the fence. Um, yeah. They wanted to put a fence around the property for security reasons, a fence and a gate, and uh, it was the it had a. The, uh, the council had to approve the sixth amended consent judgment. Lori remembers most of them fondly, I'm sure. So not sure fondly. <laughs> you remember them. Um, that was approved last night, um, and you will, re will remember Gaucho's restaurant on Rochester yeah. Road. It was approved, but the deal fell through, and we were left with that that building that was on 
on the site, and a um, the building of the property was purchased was acquired by someone who, who is going to reuse the, the building as a restaurant. It's going to be a um, Japanese steakhouse and sushi place. Is that the one last night? And they got their liquor license last night. Okay. <coughs> they're doing. Um, they're going to improve the site. It's going to. There's going to be really not a lot of kind of heavy lifting design wise. They're going to um, you know improve the building, leave the footprint kind of where it is, fill in the truck well. They're going to improve the landscaping, and, you know, improve the parking lot, but kind of leave the site for the most part as is, although improve it. And it's going to be a restaurant. So. Mr. Schultz. So we will not see a site plan on that? Will not. Yeah. I was curious, did, did you ever hear anything from the previous uh, applicant? Here? No. Okay. No, my, I don't know, for whatever reason, it fell through, unfortunately. Well, I don't want to say unfortunately because I'm sure this new restaurant will be just, fa yes. just fantastic, but I don't know why what happened to Gauchos. Yeah. It was, uh, you'll remember the applicant, yeah. Yeah. and she had so much energy and enthusiasm. Right. Um, I I don't, don't, she, she seemed, yeah, she seemed very focused, so I was a little surprised when I didn't, uh, didn't move forward. Okay. Thank you. Anything else for Mr. Sam? That's it. All right. Next item was number eight. We were very fortunate tonight to have not only one attorney sitting with us, but we have the top dog attorney. And we're going to talk about uh, ethics uh, for the Planning Commission. And uh, without further ado, ladies, I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, well, thank you. And, and I'm always glad to uh, to come. It's, it's a little tougher after having council on Monday night, and then today was a little bit busy. but. Uh, but I'm always glad to, to come in front of you, and I know, um, I think you guys, I think pretty much mostly everybody has heard um, the presentation that I give on the Open Meetings Act, and I think maybe on one of the other boards that we've been on, and I think, um, Mr. Shepke, I think you've on, I think, Traffic Committee, or were, you were on the Traffic Committee, is that correct, or you were on? Yes, I was. Okay, uh, yeah, so, so most of you have heard it, other than Eric, you probably have, have not heard it yet, <laughs> so, um, so, but I'm not uh, planning on doing a whole lot with the Open Meetings Act, other than just, again, just to give a, a brief refresher, because I think that's always part of um, your responsibility, and so I'm, I'm just going to give just a couple of, um, you guys know all of this anyways, but um, with Open Meetings Act, it's really important that everyone who does come before you get an opportunity to speak. Um, you all know that, but uh, it, it is important. I loved hearing the, the, um, the preface that you give because, again, that's great. It tells everybody these are the rules that we're going to abide by. Um, are you still requiring them to sign up beforehand? Yes. Okay. And you can do that, and you can require them to say whether they're a resident or not a resident, because that does impact how you view their <coughs> um, So, So that is appropriate, and, and that's why you need that information. If they're a resident or if they're impacted, it allows you to, to figure that out. Um, and um, other than that, I do you have any specific questions on the Open Meetings Act? The one, there's a couple interesting things. But, um, to keep in mind, could you elaborate on a couple things? One on uh, emails, mass emailing. Oh. Um, for example, if, if if you start to have a dialogue via email, could you comment on that? And could you comment on a situation where maybe it's after a meeting or maybe it's informally at another or another event where there's a quorum of of, uh, of planning commissioners, what they can and cannot deliberate upon? Um, great, great questions, and, and thanks for that, Brent. Um, email is, is one of those areas that is fast becoming um, controversial, but an email, you can have a meeting via email or instant messaging or, you know, any of these, uh, you know, like the conference calls anymore, you, you don't really have that to worry about as much anymore, but um, emails, you can have a meeting via email. And um, I think you've heard me say this before, never, ever, 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 ever use the reply to all button. That should be removed from your computer so that you do <laughs> not use it um, in connection with uh, any, you know, conversations that you have. Um, the other big thing in the way, if you need to communicate, you want to get information uh, to everyone, you can communicate with the administrators. So Brent uh, and Sue, they can get your information and then get it to everybody all at the same time. They, you can communicate with them, but do not communicate with one another. 
you really need to, to focus on not doing that, especially if you just do an innocent, you think it's an innocent reply to all, and then somebody responds to it using the reply to all, and there's a meeting, and you didn't notice it, and so it's a violation of the Open Meetings Act. So you need to be very, very careful about that. Um, be very careful about um, the subquorum groups as well. Um, if it looks like you are um, forming smaller groups with the intention of avoiding the Open Meetings Act, then that's going to be a violation as well. So you need to, to be careful of, of both of those. Again, I just if the rule of thumb is always, um, you know, just err on the side of openness, err on the side of not doing it, use your administrators if you, you know, if you need to, um, and always call us if you have any questions about what you're, you know, how, how do you get this information? Um, you know, just call either Sue or I or, you know, anybody in our office, any of the attorneys, we're always happy to, to answer a quick question on that and to help facilitate. I mean, we're here to help you in doing your job. You guys have a very difficult job and we're here to help as much as we, as we can on that. Um, so that's with the, the, um, the email and uh, instant messaging and texting and all of that. You need to worry about all of that because all of it could potentially be uh, a meeting. Uh, the, yeah, you had a question, Doug? Uh, I know some of us, or quite a few of us perhaps, uh, make site visits. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never seen another planning commission member at this. But I'm just curious, what what is the requirement on our part? Uh, should we uh, you know, knock on the door and, and introduce ourselves, or should we just go ahead because I understand the applicant signs that he would have permission to come on site. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always just a little bit uncomfortable about that, but it's, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if you have any guidance on that. Yeah, and, and thanks for that question as well. Um, because that's really one of the, the areas that you guys do deal with, um, is that you want to go because it, it does matter what the site looks like. Um, I always recommend that if you're going to, to the site, um, you know, you don't want to be rude. Um, you can let them know, I'm a planning commissioner, I'm just going to look around, but it's really important that if there's information that is presented to everybody at the table so that everybody has a benefit of it, and also so that you're not accused of impro you know, improper communications, just tell them right up front, I'm here, I'm just going to look, I'm just going to you know, take in. If you have information, though, please send it to Brent. Um, and, and he will get that to all of the Planning Commission members or certainly come to the Planning Commission meeting. Here's the time, you know, if you have any questions, I mean, you give him Brent's number and, and have him call Brent. Um, but yeah, you, you can go. Now, be careful of how many of you go to the site um, because, again, if there are a number of you that are all visiting the site at the same time, um, you can have a meeting on the site and you haven't posted that and so that's a meeting and so that's a that's an open meetings act violation as well yeah something i fought for early on and i think it's very yes. important though is that if you're going on site visits have this with you it identifies you as a member of the planning commission it has your term expiration on it and you get them from the, if you don't have one get it through the police department and that way when you walk on site and somebody says, excuse me, but just who are you? You can say, well, I'm representing the city. Yeah, if they're expired, you need to get them renewed. Yeah. And, and I, I got mine renewed, and I'm 10 years younger in the picture. Because <laughs> they use the same picture. I still have hair. Yeah. <laughs> The, you said any number of us cannot visit. Is there a number we've got? Uh, yeah. Well, you, you, the, 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 you know, the hard and fast rule is you can't have quorum, okay. which, that's right. you know, that's the hard and fast rule. But again, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're doing smaller groups and then you're communicating the information, so you have a, a group of three and another group of three and another group of three, and you're sharing the information amongst one, you know, then you're going to, that's going to look like it's a violation of the Open Meetings Act because you're, you're trying to circumvent it. So, so you need to be careful. And, and the bigger thing, too, is um, you can get information from another person 
Um, and if you're if you're close to a quorum, what you can't do is say, I know how Commissioner A and B and C are going to vote. You know, you you can't communicate that to them because if you do, um, then that's going to look like it's um, an attempt to circumvent the Open Meetings Act. So you're you're not supposed to do. You know, just again, you can you can be in a place. Um, social gathering or something like that you can you know more than one as long as you're not deliberating on issues that are going to be coming before you you can all be at a place you can all gather you know hear a presentation or something um, but it's when you are deliberating that that's that's what causes the problem and um, another thing too even if you're not violating the Open Meetings Act always be aware of the appearance of impropriety um, you know, you may be very innocent, and I know all of you, and I think that all of you are not going to be intentionally violating the Open Meetings Act. Um, however, people may see you um, discussing with another planning commissioner, they're going to assume that you're talking about a planning commission item. And that gets into the question, Brent, that you had about, um, like, afterwards, if you're going afterwards. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm not here to, you know, tell you you can't have any fun and you can't socialize, um, but be very mindful of, of the appearance of impropriety. If a petitioner didn't get what they wanted to do and then they see all of you afterwards going out to a restaurant or something, they're going to challenge the decision that was made and um, they're going to say, you know, hey, you guys were talking about this. Um, and you shouldn't have been talking about it. You were deliberating, and um, then you're going to have a potential Open Meetings Act violation. So you, you need to be cautious of that. Yes? Uh, when, we, when Tom and me went up to these classes at uh, the Grand Traverse Resort, they got into the legal aspects, and one thing that I wanted to find out more about is conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. they, uh, when they went into conflict of interest up there, they kind of included over a broader spectrum than I would personally have, have uh, thought about it and they had different um, made up cases you know and then they had maps and how close the people live to the locations and everything uh, how does what what kind of the legal department in Troy um, first of all what are your what are your penalties for conflict of interest and number two is uh, uh, how do you I mean do you have a narrow look at it or is it is it if you live within a certain area, or if you have a relative, or how, how do how do you how do you interpret a conflict of interest, and um, what are the penalties? It's not a black letter uh, law. I mean, you, you're not going to have you know the, the, this is what it is. Um, a, a couple of things, and, and we we're going to actually kind of go through, and you may have already discussed some of um, these. Uh, these hypotheticals that we have, but um, there are some hypotheticals kind of to talk about um, how, how you do the analysis to try and figure out um, whether or not it's a conflict. But I can tell you um, absolutely if you or a family member you know, financially benefits from um, a, a partnership, if it's a, if it's a business that comes before you and you or an immediate family member financially benefits from that, then it's going to be a conflict of interest. Um, I can also tell you that um, if an error on the side of caution, disclosure is fabulous. If you're not sure whether or not it's going to be a conflict of interest, disclose it at the table and just say, I have this relationship, or I live within, you know, I, I live within 300 feet of this property. I am not going to, you know, I, I'm far enough away that it's not going to matter to me, but I wanted to disclose that. Planning commissioners, do you feel like I should um, be recused from voting on this? And, and let the other planning commissioners tell you. You're, you're doing the disclosure. You're never going to go wrong in, in making that disclosure. Um, and err on the side of, you'll you find I'm very conservative, I err on the side of, of caution and always try and make that disclosure whenever you can. Um, so I don't know if that helps you. That, it helps, I just I just wondered. I like the idea of talking it over with the co other commissioners ahead of time mm -hmm. and uh, because 
I think that you can really get uh, some real sticky situations if, if you try to, uh, even uh, not knowing uh, and just keep it under your hat. So it's better to bring things out on the table. I agree with that. But uh, <coughs> all right, I think and, that pretty well answers the question. And, and the other thing too, and, and um, you know, Sue and or I or Alan um, and Julie will will eventually be coming uh, uh, to do the rotation. Planning. Yeah, doing the rotation as well. Um, if you are not sure about whether or not it's a conflict of interest, please call us or email us. We're we're happy to help you work that out. We're also happy to help you. Um, and giving you kind of a you know text. This is what you can say um, on, on that. So um, you know you, you always can can do that. If you're not sure if you you know if you have a relationship and you're just not sure, um, please let us know and we'll and you know we'll certainly work with you on that. We'll let you know what our opinion is. Um, again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but you know we, we probably have been through a few more situations, so that might be able to. So if I could add to that, you would ask, what's the penalty? Um, the state statute, the Planning Commission Act, actually says that um, a conflict of interest is, if you don't disclose it, and you, um, it could be malfeasance or misfeasance in office, mm -hmm. and you could be charged with that. But again, it just defines how, it, it doesn't distinguish what the conflict of interest is in the state statute. So basically, I think from what Lori said, as long as you pay attention to the financial interest, that's always the big one. That's always the case law one that you didn't tell someone you're going to financially, and that's obvious. If you're going to make money off something, it's going to might sway your vote. So those are the more serious ones. The other ones are all gray areas. And uh, if, you well, look if it's at the on the next block or something like that, that's not a financial thing. It is, but it, it's an aesthetics thing, or it could affect your property values too. So. Right. Yeah. And and Sue, good good point on that one. Um, and that is MCLA 125-3815. And it doesn't say a whole lot, but it does say the legislative body. Um, it says before casting a vote on a matter in which a member may reasonably be considered to have a conflict of interest, the member shall disclose the potential conflict of interest to the planning commission. The member is disqualified from voting on the matter if so provided by the bylaws or by a majority vote of the remaining members of the Planning Commission. Failure of a member to disclose a potential conflict of interest as required by this subsection constitutes malfeasance in office unless the legislative body by ordinance defines conflict of interest for the purposes of this subsection, the Planning Commission shall do so in its bylaws. So that's, that's what the state statute provides. Um, malfeasance in office do you know what that is? That's, um, it's kind of like misconduct in office. Um, you're not doing what you are sworn to do. Um, you're not performing your duties. And the sanctions for that could be a removal from your position, um, you know, after due process hearing, but it could require a, a removal. Um, one of the bigger things and the thing that, that affects the community is if you vote on something and you are the deciding vote, and you had a conflict of interest, then later on that decision can be invalidated. So um, that's a potential conflict as well. Um, there are also some criminal penalties, um, which are generally misdemeanors, um, punishable by up to 90 days and up to $500. In terms of process, due process for malfeasance for removal uh -huh. of a planning commissioner, not that we're going to go down that road, but just out of yeah. curiosity, just for discussion purposes, if if Planning commissioner is found that they they participated in guilty of malfeasance. Mm -hmm. That's a city council public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and uh, Birmingham had a situation where they actually removed a planning commission member, um, and the only reason I know about it is because it went up through the through the courts, and so um, that that did happen in Birmingham, and. Um, what they did in that particular case is they sent them, you know, they said, we think that you've committed malfeasance. This is what we think you've done. You can come before city council and have the opportunity to explain and justify what you did. And then city council had the obligation to figure out whether or not, um, you know, they, they made that call as to whether or not they thought it was um, a violation. And they did. They removed him and he challenged it, but ultimately, um, he, he was gone. He was not able to return to the Planning Commission. 
What's the difference between malfeasance and misconduct? Um, <laughs> boy, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Sue, do you? Have... I've always thought that as one is an action that you take versus an action you don't take. Oh. Kind of yeah. malfeasance versus, well, that's kind of nonfeasance, but yeah. it's it's an act. There's a difference between not taking action or taking action. <laughs> Affirmatively, so that's kind of basically how I've always thought about it. Could you give like a quick example of like misconduct? Um, misconduct would be, of course, a, a conflict of interest. Uh, uh, well, it would be something that you didn't do. So it'd be something like, uh, well, failing to disclose a potential conflict of interest is malfeasance. It's what. It's, it's okay. okay. But also, let's say that. Um, let's say somehow or other you recused yourself or you, you missed a series of meetings and you were legitimately able to come or there was something that you didn't do that was a procedural thing, that could be considered not acting according to procedural rules. It would probably be something more like that than an action. How extensive do you uh, consider a financial aspect of this. You know, okay. I could I could think, you yeah. know, in my neighborhood yeah. there was a developer going to do a, mm -hmm. do a couple of developments and uh, based mm -hmm. on what I know about property values, it could very well have affected my my property. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't I was not on the planning commission when that came up. But you know, generally speaking, if there's a, a large development going in adjacent to you, it doesn't typically more than often increases your property value. So is that a financial interest? Mm -hmm. Again, you it's, it, you know, there, these are all kind of gray, gray areas. Um, and, you know, again, we, we're happy to help you work through kind of some of those issues if you suspect that, um, that, that you, I, I guess the rule of thumb is, are, um, is it such an interest that, um, it would cause a person to be suspicious that that your reasons are not pure, that your um, that your reasons are to increase your property value, not not view the development in the best interest of the public. And it might also be um, the fact that if you don't have a direct financial interest, it might be something in terms of immediacy, maybe. You uh, happen to know that developer, uh, and you you want to mark you want them to market your house or something in the future. I mean, that's maybe something that you want to think about. Is that a conflict, even though you're not making any money right there? Um, I don't think there. Most of the time, the law says that you don't have to exclude yourself just because you're a homeowner in the subdivision. You, if you feel that you can be fair and impartial and you don't have a direct financial interest just because you're a member of the community and you happen to live in the area doesn't mean you have to. That's not a conflict in of itself, so you have to judge on those particular facts as it affects you. Another um, example is a bank. You may be a customer in a bank, and a bank is coming before you. Um, you know, if you're a shareholder in that bank or one of the officers in that bank, that's clear. Don't vote on it. Recuse yourself. Get out of there. Don't even participate in the discussion. If you just merely have an account in that bank and, um, you know, it's not a huge account or, you know, you don't have a vested interest, you're fine in voting on it. It's not going to be a conflict. But shouldn't, it was my choice, but if, if there is going to be deliberation on something that is in proximity to a piece of property that we own, mm -hmm. e each of us individually, <clears throat> should it not be disclosed to the planning commissioners and the, the petitioner mm -hmm. that my property is in proximity to this and you may get a very welcome reception or you may get a very chilly one depending on my feelings <coughs> on that mm -hmm. particular development. Um, you know, if, if someone's home is in proximity to a development and they become obstructionist to that development just because they don't want it there, um, I think it needs to be disclosed that, you know, I do live X number of feet from this proposed development. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And let's say that there, you know, if you want to, it connects to the back and you've got wetlands or something and you want to preserve all of the, the natural habitat that, you know, would come from this property, your interest is going to be such that you need to disclose that because you are going to be probably impacted or at least there's going to be an appearance that you're impacted. And, and again, I mean, you've, you've, <laughs> You've been doing this for a long time, and, and you err on the, on the side of, of caution as well, and, and certainly you're, you're right, you're spot on. Disclose it, and you're always better off. You're always better off in, in being open and transparent. Um, let people know, you know what, what you've got out there, and then again, if, if your planning commissioners don't feel like you should be voting on it, they're going to let you know. As, as kind of an aside, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. It's oh, right. interacting with developers that may come before committee on the outside of the committee. So, um, it's always my very strong recommendation um, that whatever developer um, provides, you want them to provide it every, to everybody at the same time. You don't want to be accused of um, getting information from them or feeding them with, with information. You certainly can never tell them how you're going to vote because you don't know how you're going to vote until they present their proposal to you and you hear the dialogue, you hear all the public comments. So you can't, um, you know, you can't tell them how you're going to vote. It's always my strong recommendation to, to not put yourself in that position. Um, you always can, can blame it on us and you can say to a developer, the attorney's office said, I can't, I can't talk to you, you have to bring it up at, at the planning commission meeting. And, um, you know, certainly that's a, a best practice so that you're not accused of being unduly influenced. And, and also, it does provide the same information to everyone. If a developer wants to send information uh, to, to the city, get it to Brent. And Brent can get it to everybody at the same time. But yeah, that's a, and, and those are the, that's why I'm, I'm glad that this is pretty informal because these are the questions that you guys are dealing with. So I'm, I'm glad yeah, to have. And I believe it was you and I just after a meeting right. recently. <clears throat> we had a, a potential developer come up and just speak to the two of us afterwards. And mm -hmm. my first recommendation was you need to talk to Mr. Savin. We're not the ones right. you're, we're not the ones to come and ask what can I put on this piece of property. That's what we have a planning department for. Mm -hmm. Having a conversation with the person, I have no problem. But right. I'm not gonna tell them you can put this, this and this and not this and this on this piece of property. That's not my job. It's mm -hmm. not either of our job. Yeah, and, and you know, and it is tough. I mean, you know, you don't want to be rude, and you want to um, demonstrate that we are pro pro business and, and pro development, and, because I, I think that we are. I mean, I you know, you want to demonstrate that. You want to be professional, um, but again, if you need to have a we're we're here. We can you know you can just say we said don't do it. And, you know, they can provide their information through other channels. I was going to come at the conflict of interest issue from another angle. I've seen it happen where um, a planning commissioner didn't want to be on the hot seat. They were uncomfortable. For example, oh, we're on the Rotary Club together, or you know, we we go boating together, you know, every summer or something. And it wasn't a conflict of interest, but they didn't want to be made uncomfortable, so they tried to get out of voting by saying they had a conflict of interest, but really it wasn't a conflict of interest. I will tell you, um, in our charter, um, City Council um, is required to vote on every item unless they are excused by all the members. Um, and if you don't do that, then that is misconduct in office. So, um, so just, but again, it doesn't necessarily apply to you, but you do have to be mindful. If, if you're abstaining because you, th you know, and, you're, and your interest is just minimal, um, you know, then you may not, the developer may not get a proposal through that, that is in the best interest of the community. Um, and so, so again, it's, you know, you definitely want to disclose it. Most times you're probably not, you're going to know if you have a, a conflict of interest. You're, you're probably pretty much going to know and the rest of the commissioners are going to know as well. And that, that becomes a problem since we're on we have a requirement for five affirmative votes to approve anything because city council put that limitation on us. <clears throat> if you don't have a full commission, mm -hmm. that can that can get dicey for a, for a petitioner. 
because there may be seven people present, but you may get it used to be it was the majority of those present. Now it's a majority of the nine-person council or commission, and that, that makes it tough on petitioners sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that sort of issue has come up when I was on the Board of Zoning Appeals, where we would offer the uh, person coming in to present their case an opportunity to defer it until there was a bigger quorum available because in that case, they had to achieve, I think, four votes, you know, out of the seven. And so, in this case, if, if you don't show up, you could potentially be restricting developments. Right, because it's going to be at least, in, in the BZA, it, they have to decide, is it worth waiting another month, you know, to, to, to come back or not. Um, but, you know, here, it's, it's you meet a little more frequently than, than that, so it's not as much of a hardship. But, yeah, it's always good to, to let them be in the driver's seat because, again, you're showing your pro-development, you're showing that you're as accommodating as possible, as professional as possible, um, and you know, and, and they don't have a basis really to challenge your decisions. Okay, any other? Wait, um, so we do have uh, some some hypotheticals. Do you want to go over those? Sure. Okay, I'll let you. Well, These are fun. Yeah. Well, it, I guess the, the the other thing too, and this is um, I think the I have already seen that. Yeah, the, the community that. planning code of ethics. Do you have this? No. All right. I have well, this. Then. I have a great big book of stuff you gave us before. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> and you notice I didn't. I, I'm giving you one sheet tonight. I'm not giving you the very thick books tonight. But um, this is actually we can't take credit for it. Um, it is the Michigan Association of Planning. Community Planning Code of Ethics, and so, um, it, and it's, um, safe one. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's just, just yeah. one one page, um, and I don't know if you wanted to just kind of read through it yourself, and then if you have any questions, um, or if you'd rather that we can go through. Good hand over the way. Let's, yeah, let's just, I'll let everybody take a couple minutes to read through it, and we can open up the discussion of questions. No, oh, I didn't take one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was good planning. Oh, she stacked them all up. I know. didn't take one for myself. Yeah. Two. Looking I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm, I was thinking, thinking of. If you're ethical or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking. Um, given that um, the malfeasance issue and, and the due process and the removal of a plan commissioner, I mean that's a pretty stiff. That's a pretty steep, pretty big hurdle. It's a pretty tough road there, and, and it's I think pretty. I don't want to say extreme, but I mean to really. To, to go down that road of malfeasance in front of city council, we're talking to really, this is a pretty reasonable group of individuals here. To go down that road, I think, is that's pretty steep. But I'm just wondering if there's a way to maybe incorporate these ethics this or another code or, or maybe some rules or some standards into our bylaws or have the planning commission, you know, uh, sign, agree to, to adhere to a code. As when they're when they're appointed or something like that, that maybe would would give the planning commission itself some teeth, without 
having to go in front of the you know city council for a public hearing that's, that's really extreme to me i don't know that's just kind of my thoughts when i read this i think you'd still have to go in front of city council because they're the appointing authority if for the extreme case yeah right. not reporting a financial interest or something but it certainly wouldn't be I mean, to, to adopt your own code of ethics or maybe even something like this, just say that, uh, you know, you accept the standards of the Michigan Community Planning Ethics yeah. Code of Ethics or something, because they're very general. Uh, the minute you start putting laws on it, you're kind of deviate from, I mean, let's see, I've been doing the board on and off for 11 years now, and I can tell you all the different members that I've seen it would be pretty rare for this board to do anything terribly unethical. It's just not going to happen. Um, what I, I was thinking was it was giving the, the planning commission maybe ability to kind of police itself versus having to take that step. And I'm not suggesting anyone who's going to kind of be involved in malfeasance, but what I'm saying is if, if a planning commissioner steps over the line, the planning commission could give them some teeth to kind of say, ah, 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 wait a minute, you know, we've got the code, we've, you signed this, or we've got the bylaws, or whatever, whatever the case may be, it would kind of keep it in house and allow the planning commission itself to kind of say, wait a minute, remember this. I'm just, I'm just kind of disgusting right now. If I could tag on to what Brent just said, it was my understanding that the city council passed a, a code of ethics that was going to apply to all new members of boards and committees, is that true? Um, yes, it, it is, um, and... Um, but that wouldn't apply to the current ones. Um, well, uh, most of the things that are in the council's code of ethics right. are things that you're obligated to do. It's just basically reducing them to uh, right. one page, you know, these are the standards, and just again, reaffirming. This is what you're obligated to do. These are, are your responsibilities. I think it's always a great idea to um, to have a code of ethics, whether it's the one that council has designed or whether it's the community planning code of ethics. This is specifically designed for planning commissioners, and, and you guys do have um, different roles um, for, for the city than, uh, than do other, uh, um, other appointed officials and elected officials, certainly. Um, so I think something like this certainly can be done. Um, it's a little more difficult when you really want to put teeth in it um, because Sue's right, council is the appointing authority. So council does have the ability to remove you. They get to decide whether or not it rises to that level. Um, but again, I think it's, it's good to, to police yourselves as well. Um, and if you wanted to have something like it, I mean, I think you guys could all reach some kind of an agreement or you could all sign on that you know you agree to these I think it's a great idea just to read them every once in a while um, again it's uh, you know I was just today refreshing you know re reviewing my lawyers oath again I have it posted and I do occasionally review that just because you know you need to keep that fresh in your mind uh, so so maybe that's something you could put in, in the bylaws that you will each year, January, in the January meeting, that all of you will refresh and review and, and um, sign up. Yeah. I can see a benefit to what Brent said. Because uh, when I joined, I was not given anything like this. It was like, you know, I, you know, I started sending out emails to people, and the people are, you know, nobody told me I can't. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we're, I can't absorb by osmosis. You know, there, has, there should be a formal some kind of formal document at the beginning to say, here are our rules, please follow mm -hmm. these, and that's fine, that I know the rules. Right. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. all, I think, that's what we need to have. Mm -hmm. it might, and it also might be helpful, and based upon what the um, State Planning Act says, if, if you're concerned about conflicts, you could develop a procedure where you can have a vote for conflict. If you're not sure, one of the members is not sure, you could write that into your procedures, mm -hmm. that when we have a when we have a conflict, of course, financial would be definitely something that you would need to vote on. You don't want anybody saying you have to vote when you have a financial interest, so that would be something you'd put in your rules that says if it's a direct financial interest, you recluse yourself. But on these issues that are not black and white, then you could set up a procedure for voting. 
with some, you know, you don't want to make them too severe, but some types of guidelines where you could vote and say, no, we believe that's not a conflict, and you're going to vote, and, we, we, and, and say that. You can, we would Then you have those situation where somebody's totally uncomfortable, like your situation, that they just don't want to vote. It might be their best friend, best friend and, and you just can't see yourself putting yourself in that spot. Even though you think you could be fair and impartial, you just don't want to do it. And you could resolve those issues and maybe in some dialogue on how you're going to handle those. And if you wanted to do the, the standard, sometimes that will help. I mean, again, how much, of a, you know, how much money do you have to have in the bank before it becomes a conflict for you to, to hear something on the bank or something? I mean, you could do that if you, if you felt like that was help, would be helpful. Or how close do you have to live, you know, to uh, development in order for it to be um, considered a conflict? Thomas turning this over to mine. I'm just, I'm just looking back at the last ten or eleven years in what is left of my mind, <laughs> and I think maybe in ten years we've had less than a dozen in instances where planning commissioners have brought forward potential conflicts and I can only think of three or maybe four instances where someone actually left the room because they in fact had a conflict and it was, was most of and it was mostly one person yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and his initials are Mike Hudson yeah. <laughs> But, you know, that was interesting because you disclose it. A couple were so blatant that no vote uh, could keep me there. But somewhere on the edge, and the commissioners would uh, take a vote, say, is it a conflict enough to excuse you? And uh, most of the time they say, no, it's, don't worry about that. I mean, I brought up the fact that we've had petitioners come in that because I was a businessman here in town for several years, I had done business with people that were coming in for building changes or a new building to go up and I'm going well you know I worked with this I was a customer of this man for seven or eight years um, I think the public needs to know that because I have both a professional and 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 personal relationship with with these people and I don't think it's going to sway my vote but it might so let somebody else decide that. But Bob, do you feel that since you've been on the board that I think the board has handled it quite well? I mean, the times that I do remember you voting at least on one occasion since I've been in the re-rotation uh, where somebody wasn't comfortable with the conflict and you voted, you put it on the table and you voted. I mean, so far it's worked without any mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't recall everything. Every, I haven't talked to Alan about this, and, but it seems to me like uh, the board has handled those conflicts well. You kind of have a natural sense for what's fair and just and how best to present it to the public, and it's worked for you. So well, I, I think part of that is because we have a mix of people that have been here 10 or 11 years and people that have been here one year, and there there is a consistency and a flow to the organization. We don't get reelected every year three or four years and start with a massive number of new people. We, uh, we have some consistency through the years. I had a situation that uh, I felt uncomfortable with because do you have to uh, disclose the reason why you would like to be excused? Well, Let me give you an example. Vote, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Another architect came before and uh, before us, I felt uncomfortable in voting against it, mm -hmm. but I, I was uh, really, a, it was the right thing to do. But yet I felt uncomfortable even in doing that. I would have rather just excused myself, not put myself in an embarrassing situation because of the relationship that I had with the guy. Now there's a point that you mentioned before, if there was a relationship, you can excuse yourself. Yeah, if it's going to impact your, you know, if, if you don't feel like, you know, if, if, if it's going to be perceived by somebody else 
if you were former um, partners or you know former associates, um, people are you know maybe suspect if you if you vote on that. Yeah. Well, it wasn't any of it those, like but okay. <laughs> just a, a, a relationship. See, I could serve on like I, I serve on some of the committees, the AIA committees. Mm -hmm. right. Some of them come before me. I know them, but yet I feel kind of uncomfortable. I'm sure, John, you may have felt that way. I don't know if you've had or not. But, uh, well, I, I've had that over the years yeah. that I've been here. There have been quite a few architects, not quite a few, but a few architects. Mm -hmm. And this I'm wondering how I can excuse done. myself without disclosing. That is my the, discomfort. This is something that I would have to check with Lori and I, our clerk, but I've always been under the impression, some of you know Robert's Rules of Order a lot better than I do, but I've always been under the impression that if you wanted to restrain from voting without explaining, your vote got counted with the majority whether or not you explained it. So I will check on that rule for you. So if you choose not to explain your vote, your vote, they count your vote as a majority vote even if you don't vote. And have you ever but, heard of that? Well, but, but what you're looking to do is you're looking to, you don't want to say, I want to be, um, you know, you don't, you you don't, don't want to say why you're conflicted. Right. You just want to say that you're conflicted. Right. right. So you're not actually going to vote on it. You just want, this is the... Exactly. Exactly. So I, I don't know. So far, well, I've had a few times that I felt guilty about one in particular that comes to my mind where I voted against it. And I'm sure the guy thinks it. <laughs> nice well, but, but he probably thought that before. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that actually is one of the things. So, if you're voting against it, have reasons why you're voting against it, and put those on the record. Um, you, you know, you you can do. I don't want to make your meetings too long, Mr. Chairman. But um, but really, if you tell them the reasons why you're voting against it. First of all, it communicates to them that maybe they can make a couple tweaks here or there. Um, you know, and, and maybe that, that would be the issue. But um, secondly, if you, if you disclose it, then it's clear that, you know, you're, you're basing your decision on the development that's in front of you, not any personal relationship that, that you have. The situation I'm referring to, the majority voted against it. I felt okay, but I'm sure in one way he's looking at me and saying, how come you voted against it? Mm -hmm. Although everyone disclosed the rationale behind why right. the various things that they didn't like about it. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, that's... You guys have I, a tough I have job. A person, that's, I didn't know you how have, to handle that. You have a tough job. You have to review, you know, proposed development, and sometimes you have to say no. It's not in the best interest of the community. Yeah. And you may get criticized for that. Um, I, you know, I, again, that's that's part of the job. It's not easy. I wish I could take that all away from you, but um, I can't. And you know, um, again, all all you can do is just explain your reasons why, um, and make sure that that you're true to to your mission, which is to approve what's in the best interest of the community. Any questions on the? document that was just passed out. And Mr. Chair, if you did want to uh, put it in your bylaws that you will review it once a year, that's a pretty easy change and that um, could be done. I think January is your, um, when you um, have your organizational meeting anyways. And so perhaps um, it's coming up pretty quickly. And so um, if that's something that the board was interested in doing and just saying that you're going to review it and sign on and, and commit to, to um, whether it's this or whether it's the you know city council one or whatever it is. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, is there much difference? No, the, um, the city council ones. Um, uh, I have. Um, let's see, the city council ones. I have them, and we can certainly get them to you as well before before the January meeting. But um, they're they're essentially the, the same things. Um, city council. Um, rec um, Recognize confidentiality of privileged information. Recognize that individual members have no authority to speak or act for the whole entity. 
um, work with everyone else to establish um, effective policies, delegate authority for um, the running. Some of these are not going to be applicable, um, but um, encourage free expression of opinion by all members, seek systematic communications between um, staff, uh, planning commissioners, and all elements of the community. Render decisions based on available facts and independent judgment rather than succumbing to the influence of individuals or special interest groups. Make every effort to attend all meetings. Be informed concerning the issues to be considered at each meeting. Avoid conflicts of interest or the appearance thereof. And refrain from using the position for personal benefit or for the benefit of family members or business associates. So we can get you a copy of that. Mm -hmm. like I think a few of those would be very good. The boards and committees, that one was tweaked. It was tweaked. It is tweaked. It is a little bit. I mean, I have the council one, but it is a little. It's. It's. We'll get that for you. Though. That reminds me. We were, uh, as a board, we had a cigar business come before us looking for, I forget what it was, and we approved it. And he says, okay, I got free cigars for all of you. <laughs> came up and everybody says, no, but the audience says, yeah. <laughs> So you did the right thing, well, though. You guys well, had, had, had right that thing. inspected. Yeah. Uh, you know, you did the right thing and said no. How does everyone feel about uh, instituting an ethical or ethics in our, our bylaws and, and review them once a year? I think it's outstanding. Can't do any harm. I think it's appropriate. Okay. Not only that, maybe I, I, I think we should consider going one step further and everybody signs every year. I'm on a number of uh, committees that that is the case. Every year you sign the document and it's just as well, a we, we have to do our property disclosures and right. everything every year anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Even though you just mark the box that says no change. No change. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I suspect that that's probably what's going to happen with the dissemination. It's probably going to be um, going with the, um, the, the disclosure. I, I suspect that that probably will happen. but. Um, again, it can't can't hurt to have it in two places. But I, I mean, I would like to have it as an item on the agenda to talk mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk about and it. And the first meeting in January would be the time to do that because that's where we procedurally have to do certain things, like an election. Mm -hmm. So that would be the time to do it because that way it doesn't get forgotten. And so we can work on that sure. and, and help okay. in getting that uh, language. Sounds like there's pretty much consensus. Yes. Yes, so. okay. All right, so you have okay. examples? Well, yeah, I'm going to let Sue, a, a couple of them here, and I don't know how long you want to go, and I don't know how many of them you, you wanted us to cover, but. Uh, I'll go real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll even read the answers so you don't have to the think. The benefit of this <laughs> is just very, <laughs> very, read the answer. very valuable. I found these in the American Institute of Certified Planners, and these were uh, ethics situations. So uh, it says, through the course of your duties, you form a friendship with a local landowner who periodically calls with questions about planning. He invites you to eat lunch and he buys. It says, okay. And it says, you have not suggested that an actual application over which you have some control is pending. If that were the case, the answer would be no. It is always best to keep such relationships at arm's length. Take great care to not permit public or private perception of favored action. If you meet, each should pay for the meal ordered. Equally, care must be taken not to discuss matters that are better suited for uh, the board conversations. So, and just to, to go further than that, first of all, I mean, I never ever will eat. I mean, I, I always pay my own way. I don't ever let anybody else buy any meals for me or anything. But, um, but another thing too to keep in mind. Um, Use a credit card if you can, because then you have a record that, yeah, see, I did, I paid for it. And, you know, they'll divide up the, the check or whatever. But, yeah, use a, use a credit card, and then you've got proof that, yes, in fact, you paid. Whereas with cash, sometimes you, you don't have that. I had, I had someone call, it's a developer that I think most, a lot of you know, said, hey, we want, we're going to submit an application. We want to talk to you about it. We're going to set up. Come meet at our country club at 7 o'clock <laughs> over dinner. We'll talk about our application. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Yeah. Between 8 and 4.30, we'll set up a time. Come to City Hall. I mean, imagine if, if yeah, someone well, saw that. Yeah. That'd be on the news. And right. some, exactly. some actually, some people they call you don't understand that that's not a good idea. They think they're being 
gracious. Oh, gracious. And if you explain it to them, they will understand. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's in their best interest to not have anyone think that, that they're, you know, that they're trying. Okay, Sue, for the next one, don't, don't, don't give the answer. Don't give the answer. Okay. Right <laughs> okay um, well, this is... This one's kind of already been discussed, so what's your answer here? Um, there have been a rush of invitations for me as planning director or planning commissioner to join such groups as Kiwanis, Toastmasters, Chamber of Commerce. Is there a balance of work in leisure clubs that does not violate any code of ethics for planning commissioners? I can join any association I want as long as I don't talk about planning business as part of that association. You, when, when, you be, when you become a planning when you get, when you become a planning commissioner or a city council member, you don't give up your your life as a private citizen. Uh, in fact, they say it's an excellent opportunity to enhance the place you work and live, and the appropriate step uh, step is to clearly and repeatedly articulate articulate a separation of work and community service. Do not engage in business related activities, including private business discussions, but certainly serve your community. So you win the trip to Port of Vier, Thank you. <laughs> I would rather have had a speed queen washer and dryer. <laughs> I'll do one more since uh, I'm sure you don't want to go through all these, but this is for this is seasonal. Should a planning commissioner attend the annual Christmas party hosted by a local engineering firm for the community? Same answer. Right. As long as you don't talk a lot. Right. It says, depends on the type of party. These kinds of parties that usually have broad invitations lists and no one is attempting to hide their attendance. Usually that would be no problem. However, if there's a firm competing for a large planning development and you are on the planning commission for the commission, you might want to skip the party that year. <laughs> it's basically common sense. Or, or if they're providing you with lovely gifts and, right. you know, yeah, mm -hmm. stay away yeah. from that. But if, if they're just inviting a whole bunch of people, absolutely. And, um, and I don't know if the Planning Commission gets any gifts, but I know you yeah. get lots of food at the holidays. Do you get food from your... Hmm. Yeah. Are you insinuating I get gifts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can, tell, I can tell you this, that um, sure. we, we have, uh, we have a, a couple of companies that will drop off baskets like uh, fruit baskets or gift baskets, those are made public. Whoever, I don't take them home, I, they're on the counter, whoever wants any can have, whoever wants them can well, have some. That's what it says in here. If you, if you put the gifts on the counter and let the public in. So now you guys know to go to Brent's office. <laughs> <laughs> Next month. Yeah. Well, I will say that, I will say that the, the economy took care of a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what tax, I, lo tax laws took care of a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> the clerk's office, gets every year. I've never seen this many from funeral directors because they come so they have to file death certificates with the city and um, they always get a ton of food from funeral <laughs> directors. So if Brent doesn't have any food, go to the <laughs> grocery store and we'll find a plethora of food. But anyway, those are just some from examples. Candy that wasn't deductible anymore. <laughs> yeah. but I, I, can, I, I was going to say, I, I can tell you I've turned down piston tickets, yeah. Lions tickets, Red Wings tickets, yeah. uh, dinners, I mean that's in here too, and yeah. it's always no, don't, uh, yeah. don't ask them. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you. Do you any, any other any questions, questions or? Any other? Yeah. Okay. was always good. It's been really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was helpful. I'm glad to have the opportunity because, um, you know, again, I always love to um, promote the Open Meetings Act and especially the email um, because it, that's always a, a question that we that we get and. Um, you know, again, Sue and I are here, and Alan and, and Julie, um, again, will be starting the rotation fairly soon, I think, as well. We're here to answer your questions. We're here to provide assistance to you. And so uh, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. It, it's a great resource having in-house attorneys that are this it competent, is. so let's take advantage of it. If you have any, if you have any questions, I can ask me, and I can, I can um, access these two and Alan, or if not, Feel free to directly email them with any questions. They're very helpful. and Take them up on it because they're a great resource. I had a question. The time and I were at the groundbreaking this, this morning, we talked about the public comment mm -hmm. at the city council meetings mm -hmm. and how abusive they've become. 
And I, I wondered if um, the city has any policy regarding that. I mean, uh, you know, Tom can elaborate more on it. We talked a lot about it in, uh, this morning, but he may or may not want to, but it just, you know, it, it's almost boring and slander. I heard some hateful, nasty, toxic comments last night. That's right. No, not just last night. There, there are things said on the floor that basically defame people in this city and I think it's I just think it's really unfortunate I realize it's in public comment but I think it's really unfortunate that the people that do that aren't held accountable because they could be sued for some of the things they say and there are a lot of good people that aren't running for political office just for that reason you know why would they want to be put up to that abuse that's just totally inappropriate and uh, you know and I would hope that the city would have some public policy or something that help uh, their, their con the people that are in, on the boards and committees to protect them from that, because it's just totally inappropriate. And I just can't understand why that's happening to the extent that it's happening in the city of Troy. A couple of things. First of all, I don't um, get the sense that that's a, a problem that you're dealing with here. Yeah. We, no. we don't um, have enough people. Okay. It, <laughs> it, but, but if it were, um, we would, you know, there, there is a, a um, you know, some dialogue that is prepared and um, it has gotten a little bit stronger um, the past few meetings or so um, but you know there are some sanctions that can be taken um, for public comment you can uh, you know not rebroadcast or you can strike the public comments um, there are some things that that have been done there is a reminder that um, you know you could be personally sued for slander or um, defamation as well um, but yeah, I mean, council meetings certainly, as a regular attendee, um, sometimes the the slander, um, sometimes the the public comment, it's not as civil as should as be. it has been in past years. Or should be. So yeah, that's something that um, you know we have to work on. Um, it's a fine line. There are First Amendment rights, and you know. There's a First Amendment right for you to be critical of the way that a public official is doing their job. And, um, you know, hopefully you can be civil while you're indicating, you know, displeasure at, at how the person's doing their job. Not but, that it's just as a justification, but if, if you've ever had an opportunity to go online and view other cities and other states, it seems to be the sign of the times when people are very angry and say awful things to all of their city council members. And so it's, it's not an excuse for anything. It's just a, a, there's kind of the civility of the, the age. Is, so. But if it is a problem, let us know. I mean, if, you, if you're dealing with people who are abusive. I've never then, said it was a problem here. I don't yeah. think we've no. never encountered that. Yeah. Especially at the city council. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's not, yeah. it's not very civil sometimes anywhere. Yeah. But um, bringing up the the groundbreaking of today, you reminded mm -hmm. me that a question that you had today was um, was about the um, the Grand Saco lawsuit and mm -hmm. where is that? I don't know if you have an interest in that or not. Of course, yeah. Um, yes. yeah but uh, we just filed our briefs on appeal on last Wednesday. So it'll be another few months before we get oral argument, and then probably another few months after that before we actually receive an opinion. But it's at the Michigan Court of Appeals. Um, right now we filed our brief, and um, you know they're all public documents if anybody is interested in reading the uh, several pages. So you're, you're welcome to tell me that it's none of our business and to shut up. <laughs> How can we be building a building if the property is still in question? Yeah. The, the property actually um, it is deeded to the city. It's in the city's interest. And the city won at um, the circuit court level. And the city, um, they filed a, an immediate um, appeal of right, which was denied. Then they filed an application for leave to appeal, which that's where we are now. And that's, that's how it's granted. But um, it's, it's in the city's, um, the deed is in the city's, name and it is it belongs to the city so if Grand Saqua were to prevail on appeal mm -hmm. they would end up owning a train station 
Yeah, no, no, uh, no. There, um, there are other provisions in the consent judgment, and the court, if it were to to invalidate the deed that's that's already out there, um, then um, there's an opportunity to potentially purchase the property, or there are other options there. Um, doesn't mean that a court, even if we were to lose that case, that a court would say, okay, you have to, to give it up. Um, you know, the, the court will consider what's happened on the property, they'll consider the development and, and making their ruling. And again, we think that we have an excellent um, chance of prevailing because the requirement was that the city fund a transit center. Didn't say what size of a transit center, didn't say it had to be fully funded, <coughs> didn't say it had to be on deposit, it said sure. fund a transit center. Um, and we had budget reservations each year, um, you know, for, for uh, many years um, in our own city budget, um, which we think, well, you know, met that criteria. Um, the, the grant, the federal grant that was out there, the um, federal appropriation was another um, basis that would would satisfy that that funding and basically they didn't give a size it could have been a plexiglass bus shelter and you know a taxi cab stand or something and um, that was the, that's that's really that's all that they required in that consent judgment so we think that we've got a, a good chance of prevailing on that so it could be another three to four months you say it's probably going to be at least three to four months yeah mm -hmm. well then will that be scary decision yeah, to well, because it's an application for leave to appeal, uh, the chances of getting to the Supreme Court on that are even narrower than than what they would normally be. Um, but I never say never. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the update. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's not an appeal of right. They first have to give them the, the right to even go to the Supreme Court. Right. And that's the limit. Well, thank you both All very, right. very much. Well, wow, thanks. And you guys are out of here by 8.15. Almost. Um, I would like to uh, state I, I apologize for being late. Unfortunately, I had a problem, but I, I've heard this before. I know. But I, I know. I'm sorry, I was late. All right. Uh, no public comments tonight. Seeing no one in the public, so we'll go around the table with planning commissioner. Comments. Eric, would you like to start us off? Do you have anything? To... I don't really have anything. It seems okay. like a lot of rules, though. <laughs> <laughs> Life has a lot of rules. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, do you have anything? I just want to thank Lori and Susan for their comments. It was very informative. Thank you. Burden? Nothing tonight. Thank you. Bob? I'd like to thank you both. And it was very exciting to attend the groundbreaking this morning. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought it was wonderful. I was amazed at how many people showed up. It was really nice. That's it. Plenty to say, but I don't think this is the forum, so we'll <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, again, thank both our attorneys for being here and helping us. And uh, in the second, uh, second, what Bob said about the, the, the groundbreaking for the transit center, it was, it was spectacular. We had speakers from uh, you know, from the federal government, from local governments, from Michigan, representative from the the governor. I mean, it was a monumental event, a real great ceremony. So I just want to just express that how how the city's moving ahead uh, with, with some real progress, and I, I'm really glad that this is all coming to fruition. Mr. Schreck, I forgot to mention the train people. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the list was so long. I couldn't believe how many people were involved in that. But it was very nice, and I think it was very nice of you to come and brief us in again. Thank you very much for that. Just I think that the ceremony today was a nice justification for all the work the Planning Commission and staff has put in on this station. We have labored mightily, and it's nice to see it come to fruition. <laughs> I certainly thank you for uh, giving us the legal brief. I think it's it's good that we have this every once in a while, and I always learn something new, so I uh, appreciate it very much. I also really thought that the, uh, the uh, groundbreaking was a real milestone, and, and uh, I think we can all be proud, and particularly I want to thank the city staff, and, you know, Brent's department, as well as uh, engineering, you know, all the people, and uh, it was it was really a pleasure to attend such a wild 
a large, large event. Ladies, do you have any comments? Just enough. Yeah, just, yeah, we we have talked a lot, but you know, of course, we're attorneys, so. <laughs> so I I just want to thank all of you because you do perform a, a great service for the city, and all of you are extremely valued, and you probably don't get told that enough. So thank you. Mr. Savinant, nothing to add. Nothing to add. But uh, thank both of you for yeah. coming today. Well, I uh, I hope my comments are brief, but I hope that today is the beginning of a new chapter for the city in a lot of different ways. I mean, we have a new city manager now. Uh, I think he presented himself very well today. And yes, he did. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just hope with, uh, with Mayor Slater's comments and the, and the team up there, the council up there, I, I really hope that uh, although there's still some uh, noise along the way, I hope we can move onward and upward. And quite honestly, our charge is to uh, support economic development in this community as, as much as we can uh, within the boundaries that are put forth. So uh, with that, and again, thank you very much. Even it's a, it's a two-night in a row for you. But thank <laughs> okay. you. Okay, now I'm glad uh, to have We're adjourned. <laughs>